Um, I hope everyone is doing great. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone on our call. Um, as we uh, get started, we want to welcome you all to our sourcing RPA webinar. As Colin mentioned, the latest developments and enterprise implications. And let me share with everyone kind of what we mean by that. Typically, with Everest Group, you're going to get from us some consistent ongoing dialogue that talks about uh, tracking the whole market, the evaluations of the, the vendors in the market, and then also assessments of the technologies. But today's webinar's focus is going to be on the enterprise. We're going to be able to share some peer performance comparisons, some pricing benchmarks, and also some capability maturity models. So we want we wanted to just put this all in context for everyone today as we begin. So with that, what are let me first introduce our speakers for today. Um, first, we have Sarah Burnett. Sarah is our Executive Vice President and Distinguished Analyst at Everest Group. And she has responsibility for the company's Service Optimization Technologies Research Program. As part of this, she researches and advises clients on automation technologies, such as RPA, AI, and global service provider capabilities in these areas. In addition, Sarah is one of Computer Weekly's 50 most influential women in UK IT. Uh, as well as contributing, uh, Sarah often speaks at client and industry events and webinars. In addition, we also have Michael Jansen, who is going to be presenting as well today. Michael is our chief research guru, and he guides Everest Group's research agenda and aligns our capabilities with the market changes and next generation demands. His extensive experience is in identifying and understanding emerging trends, and Michael helps organizations maximize their global service efforts. He's also particularly known for his ability to hypothesize challenging ideas based on his fact-based insights across business and IT processes, sourcing models, and industries. Now, when you hear about the accolades of both Sarah and Michael, and then you compare it to me, where my greatest accomplishment is that I've seen every episode of Game of Thrones, I think you'll see that you're in good hands with both Michael and Sarah. So why don't we talk a little bit today about what we're going to cover. So we are going to be focused on first RPA software vendors and share any of the late breaking market developments. After that, we're going to talk about what we consider the birth of the intelligent RPA platform kind of a combination of RPA and AI. We're gonna share some key pricing metrics and then also some information on existing outsourcing relationships and what's working and what you should be aware of going forward. So there's a lot to cover. Uh, in addition, we will have a Q&A session at the end. As Colin mentioned too, if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to type them into your question box. Michael, we also have Amar Modi, who's going to uh, be uh, answering those questions. However, I want to let you know that we have a very large number of people on today's webinar. So please give uh, Amar um, some patience when he's trying to get to your questions. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Michael to kind of start us off this morning, Michael, on uh, our view of the RPA software vendor. Thank you, Alan. And so the, these are exciting times for sure in the RPA world. Um, and one of the things we wanted to start with is kind of what we labeled the RPA virtuous circle. And the backdrop to all of the, the RPA world, think about what we've been, what uh, businesses have been doing to capture, uh, create more value for the organizations and, and move productivity ahead. And that's largely been focused on labor arbitrage. So for the last 10 to 15 years, enterprises have been focused in on using uh, low cost locations to drive uh, not only cost improvement, uh, but also enable uh, additional capabilities. In the backdrop to all of that, we've been hearing about these uh, RPA or uh, software programs that have been percolating and developing uh, increasing capability. And now we're starting to see them come to the forefront in terms of enterprises getting excited about them. Uh, we're seeing an increased enhancement in the, the sophistication of these platforms. And as we bring those into, uh, into play here, 
we're starting to see that client demand is up significantly. Uh, we're looking at when we talk to clients and when we do our analysis and research, uh, we see that the value propositions are real and they're significant. And so as clients get more excited about that, then we see that uh, Wall Street and Silicon Valley are right behind that. So when money, when there's an opportunity to make money, uh, we see a significant capital infusion here. Uh, Sarah's going to talk about that in terms of tremendous amounts of money uh, flowing this direction. And at that point, when you have more money, you have the ab ability to make more investments. And the RPAs firms have uh, captured the or gained access to the capital. And now they're looking to deploy that capital in the second half of the year. And, you know, you can almost see the investments in their account uh, staffs. You can see it in the R&D. And undoubtedly, we're going to see it in acquisitions as we move forward here. So as this happens, you get more, the software platforms will get better. The value propositions will get better. We'll probably see another round of capital infusion and another round of uh, buy bill decisions. So the virtuous circle is at warp speed right now. Great. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Thanks for that uh, introduction, Alan, as well. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you all today discussing this very hot topic. And just to pick up on Michael's comments, absolutely, money is pouring in, the technology is changing and developing fast, and demand is going up as well. So let's pick on the um, money aspect. Uh, it's literally pouring into this segment, and a number of RPA vendors have already benefited. Uh, just some examples here for you. WorkFusion has had a series of rounds of funding. The most recent was 50 million Series E in April 2018. Blue Prism has raised, raised around $120 million via its IPO and a further share offering. Its share price has risen by over 1,600% uh, since the IPO. UiPath recently made history by becoming the first Romanian RPA unicorn, thanks to the 153 million Series B funding. And then to top it all, Automation Anywhere in July announced that it has completed Series A financing of 250 million. These are really significant sums. Certainly in the case of Automation Anywhere, it's the biggest for a software company that we know of. Um, there is yet more to come. We do advise PE firms and we are aware that some other deals might be coming along. So watch out, look out for uh, announcements in this space. But yeah, Sarah, if I'm, not if all I, day... I, yeah? I'm sorry, if, I, if, I, if I'm looking at my calculator here, that's over a half a billion dollars in investment so far this year. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's a lot of money. Um, but it's not all going to be an easy ride because, you know, there, there will be some challenges for uh, these companies as well. And we'll come to that. Michael, did you want to add anything else before we go to the poll question? No, let's go to the poll question here. OK, great. Alan, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. OK, so we're going to ask everyone a first poll question. Uh, what we'd love is for as much participation as possible. So as Sarah and Michael just pointed out there's been a tremendous amount of investments going to the RPA vendors. So we want to ask everyone, in your opinion, what's going to be the biggest impact of these large investments in the, the RPA vendors? Is it A, increased competition in the RPA market, or B, reduced competition in the market? C, do you think it'll be result in improved RPA products? D, improved quality of customer care by the RPA vendors? Or E, the opposite, reduce quality of customer care and intimacy by the RPA vendors. So there are, there are five choices there. The polls are open. We'd like everyone to vote. I would just like to point out that the one uh, response that unfortunately is not up here is that most of this investment would go to research firms and all the help that they can provide both enterprises and service <laughs> providers. But I, uh, I guess I'm wearing my uh, sales hat on that one. Anyway, why don't we give it a, a few more seconds. And three, two, one. Why don't we close the poll? Let's see what the results are. So the results are pretty interesting. Over half the people um, responding said that they think that it will result in improved RPA products. 
whereas the next largest is that there's going to be increased competition. So um, everything else was 10% or less. So Sarah and Michael, Sarah, I'm curious, does that kind of coincide with what you've been seeing or do you have a different take on it? Well, I think that's definitely going to be a consequence of all the investment that will go into R&D for these products. So definitely product improvements. I'm really interested in the ratio, though, 58% saying improved products and only 4% thinking that there will be reduced competition. Um, I would have thought uh, a higher percentage would have thought that. Um, and some believe there's increased competition as well, 24%. So it's a bit different um, to what I would have expected. Um, so just probably a higher percentage voting for B. Michael, did you want to comment? No, I just think this is it's, when you get this much money flowing in here, you're, undoubtedly a lot of it's going to go to the product itself, and that helps explain or, or, or perpetuate the virtuous circle that we were just describing. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So let's talk about how the leaders will be pulling away from the pack. Um, so we have a situation where we have a group of cash rich RPA vendors uh, and they will be able to invest in everything. Salespeople, offices around the world, enhanced customer support structures, product capabilities and so on. They do face challenges as well because they're growing at, an, at unprecedented rates and they will need to ensure good organizational structures for onboarding, training, and empowering their new staff to do a good job. They have to make sure that their new staff really understand their product and business. And for example, in the support area, you know, can they provide the same kind of support as those initial core uh, employees who know the product inside out? Um, and then there's customer intimacy, you know, will they manage to keep that? Um, and this is where I think we'll be looking at the renewal, the recurring revenue um, to see how they're doing in that area. They're also cash rich, so they're likely to make acquisitions to enhance their products. Some of them have already openly said that they're going to be acquiring, for example, in the AI field, and that's not at all surprising. Uh, but then the companies, the RPA vendors that are left with no cash injection as yet uh, could be really left behind. Uh, but we do know that there's more investment to come. So it's a very interesting uh, market. Michael, did you want to add anything? No, let's, let's move on to the next slide here in terms of what, what are the implications here for the, for the RPA uh, marketplace. And so... You know, as you start talking about all the money flows and all the great things that are happening, um, you know, our strong advice to enterprises is to really think about what's real and what's hype. Um, there's certainly going to be a lot of reality change, uh, improvements and enhancements in the marketplace, but there's also going to be a lot of hype. Um, when you get that much money at stake, folks are going to be aggressive in their claims. They're going to be aggressive in their, their positioning. And so uh, while we want to encourage people to look for uh, the new advancements and new what all the new uh, capital brings into the conversations. There's also some, some things to think about in terms of, uh, you know, what's going to be right for your organization. What do you need, and, and what's what's what don't you need? Second of all, uh, so there are going to be winners and losers in this conversation. Uh, right now, we have 18 uh, vendors on our our peak matrix uh, that we're tracking. Um, my expectation is that will actually increase here over the next year or so uh, before we see a pretty dramatic uh, pullback in the number of vendors that are viable uh, going forward here. So you get lots of capital to deploy, the pressure to put it out there, but then the question is what, which vendors will be able to sustain the pace? And then there are other, others you'll see that'll, that'll fall off. Um, so our recommendation is you know, create shorter durations um, as pricing and uh, value propositions change. And then finally, uh, be careful that you do have good change of control clauses in your so if you're building these into mission critical uh, operational processes, uh, you want to make sure that when uh, the fall off occurs in the next uh, couple years down the road, you're able to control your destiny and that you are uh, able to uh, roll with the punches. And maybe it's maybe it's understanding, you know, who acquired, uh, who was the acquiree or who was the acquired or who went bankrupt in the process. So make sure you, you do have good control because this is. What you see today is not what you'll see in three to five years. 
Okay. So with that said, why don't we talk a little bit more about what we consider the birth of the intelligent RPA platform. Um, and as we mentioned before, it's kind of the convergence of RPA and AI. So Sarah, would you mind kind of giving everyone an overview on our views there? Sure. Uh, so the next slide uh, shows you uh, this um, set of developments that we are seeing. This is something that we'll keep updating because things change fairly fast. Um, definitely the pace of uh, technology advances in this area is very high. Uh, this is, uh, the kind of things that we're seeing includes integration with artificial intelligence solutions and that not just to extend the scope of what can be automated but to enhance RPA's core capabilities as well. For example, uh, we've seen the use of computer vision, which you see there on the left side of the slide. Uh, and this is to enhance uh, and improve the detection and identification of objects on the screen uh, for surface integration, surface-based integration. We've also seen integration with BPM and workflow solutions. On the intelligence spectrum, We've seen intelligent workload balancing and auto-scaling of robots. Uh, this refers to the RPA platform's capability to scale, uh, increase the number of robots up or down to meet the variable process demands and workload demands. SLA-based automation monitors the processes based on the predefined SLAs and priorities set by the um, operation controller. And prior accordingly it prioritizes queues depending on the workload to meet critical requirements. Some vendors even offer forecasting capabilities to identify gaps in meeting critical SLAs and uh, as well as actually doing the uh, dynamic scaling and reprioritization of work. Then there's human in the loop uh, which provides a user interface for enabling unattended robots to communicate with the human agent to exchange information or manage exceptions in real time while the automation waits, the robot waits for the action to be performed by the human agent. So this really is the birth of the intelligent RPA platform and robots that have intelligent skills. Okay, so if you think about all those new feature functions that are being added to the robotics part of the equation here, um, you know certainly lots of excitement in that, in that, in that just that one perspective here. But I think this is going to go so much further. And so as you can think about this as the RPA platform of the future, of the future, we will be talking about um, where RPA becomes that backbone, that hub for many other enterprise automation uh, feature functions. So. Things like OCR, things like AI, some things like a analytics and, and, and other business process management tools, those all are well enabled to be integrated into the overall uh, RPA platform of the future here. And so as we talked about more capital being deployed and more feature function uh, R&D being deployed, um, think about that as many build by decisions in this equation. Uh, the integration of those other automation capabilities into the core RPA platform will become more critical and we're going to see a lot more of that going forward here. And again, I go back to the conversation. We're going to, certainly going to see a lot more talk about it. We'll, we, will, we will wait to see how it works. Um, and I think that's what's going to make this, this uh, area very exciting over the next couple of years because there is going to be tremendous movement forward here uh, uh, as, we, as we move forward. Sure, this is very exciting, this um, uh, birth of the uh, intelligent RPA platform, but what does it actually mean for organizations? Well, uh, one of the challenges that everybody's been facing is codifying their processes. Something like a Know Your Customer Process, KYC, could take thousands of robot steps to code. As a result, we get what we see as many companies automate only very simple processes, tasks, and even just collections of steps. Developments such as more pre-built libraries of robots, robot parts, methods, templates, uh, will help with this and with scaling. Enterprises will also be able to automate more. Scale requires robust 
management and con a con good controlled uh, dashboard by adding intelligent robot skills such as context and process sensitivity and awareness. Um, we are making the robots uh, more uh, in charge so they can actually um, do things uh, that a human would otherwise do. Uh, and we're also making the control panel more intelligent so that it can dynamically reprioritize work to handle long queues or increasing workloads uh, or, uh, you know, on, handle uh, a backlog in, during unsociable hours. So this will result in automation rates that are higher than many organizations have achieved so far because many are still in the early stages of their automation journey and the scale as well will increase. Vendors are also investing in better supporting um, a different IT environments, so for example, support for virtualization and offering more cloud-friendly features. We're seeing uh, the multi-tenancy, for example, appear in more products than before. Analytics and business intelligence uh, is also getting a boost because here, for using robots, you can actually collect real operational data. So if you're automating your uh, sales data or your processing, or if you're automating your order processing, finance and accounting, you can feed that real transactional data straight into your uh, business intelligence um, uh, and analytics engines for further processing and reporting. So as we look at this and we think about the implications for the enterprise here on, on the next slide, um, you know, at one level we have been talking about, and one of the, the things that's made an RPA very successful, uh, uh, just, just get started and, and for enterprises to start with or to, to scale it has been its simplicity. It's been able to create, uh, uh, you know, an uh, a, a environment where you can have a department or a user create uh, and build their own robotic uh, processes. Um, in contrast to that, when we've been talking about all these new software modules that are going to be added to the platform, uh, things are going to get more complicated. And so I think there's going to be a divergence in between the messaging of how simple this is to do and how easy it is to get started and the reality of the complexities as you start to bring more and more components together and you bring more and more uh, complex uh, um, business processes to to, uh, to to become underneath this. Um, I'd also point to the fact that uh, for enterprises need to think about where the relationship uh, is going to uh, ultimately reside. Uh, most, if, if not all, of these conversations are being started by the business operations uh, side of the house. Uh, they've gotten they, they've gotten the message, hey, I can do this. It's kind of a little bit fun. It's it's saving some, saving me some time and effort. It's 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 uh, doing helping me get out of things I don't really want to do. Um, but as it gets more complex and there's implications around security and, and business continuity and disaster and all that good stuff, uh, there is a need to bring in the disciplines that traditional IT organizations bring to bear. And so as we think about this, uh, certainly uh, there's going to be a little bit of a hot potato here between the IT and the biz ops uh, in terms of where, where, it's, where it ultimately resides. If you think about it, uh, there can be potential many, many, many places where it can start and it could happen in your HR, your finance, it can happen in your claims processing or any other uh, 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 place where there's lots of, uh, of uh, services or, or human activity involved. But ultimately, uh, we do believe that IT will be a significant player in the conversations because they're going to be the hub. They will probably ultimately own these RPA contracts going forward here. And then ultimately, uh, I always focus on, despite all the sexy uh, robots and marketing imagery that we've created here, I still ultimately come back to it. This is still a software purchase. And so as we move into the next section uh, about pricing, I think that's kind of a key component to consider. Perfect. Okay, so Michael, you, you uh, were a great segue there. We're going to talk now about something that we're always asked about here at Everest Group, and that is, can you share with us some contract pricing metrics um, so you're prepared when, when you start the negotiations? So what we'd love to do is, Sarah, to get some of your input on some of the pricing models for the RPA technology. 
Yes, sure. I think that's a very good place to start uh, about pricing. Um, I'm sure some of these models aren't any don't come as any type of surprise to uh, our audience today. Um, there are a number that are currently in practice that with different levels of take up. Uh, there's the perpetual licensing model that is common for on premise software applications, uh, the buyer pays a relatively large upfront fee for the software license and then has it for perpetuity. And this, in addition, pays an annual maintenance charge as well. Should you stop paying for that license, for that maintenance charge, then you still you can still use the software, but we no longer get updates, bug fixes and support. Uh, there are still some solutions in the RPA um, field that uh, have this kind of perpetual licensing, but by far the most have the subscription-based or fixed capacity model. Um, this is where the buyer subscribes the software on an annual basis, and this includes the upgrade and maintenance, the minor upgrades and maintenance fees. Um, there is a fixed fee per term, typically per robot, sometimes with a stipulation for a minimum number of robots or for a fixed number of years or both, but not everybody practices this. The majority, you know, you, this is a great way to start small. You can buy one robot and get started. Uh, and this is by far the commonest model. Then we have transactional or process-based pricing when you pay a small sum for each transaction that a robot does. Uh, they're typically price bands for the, the number of transactions um, and so you can have high volume tra transaction price, you can have a low volume transaction price, etc. We're seeing the beginnings of usage based. Uh, this is where different aspects determine the price. This could include the number of robots used over a period of time and other factors such as uh, how long the robots run each day, overall workload capacity. This is probably the best model for those who've got very uh, significantly varying uh, requirements, the workloads and volumes. Uh, so this is something to consider. Ad based pricing is still quite rare. It's really the fact that you have to establish a baseline and then measure uh, on that, progress on that, and have quantitative data in order to be able to get a good estimate for how much you're, you are to pay your vendor. In the gain sharing model, buyers would share their gains drive from RPA with um, vendors. Uh, this is really very rarely used. And this takes us nicely into the next poll question. Alan. Great. Thanks, Sarah. So Sarah just laid out for you a number of different approaches and pricing models. So our question for everyone today is, what pricing units would you like to use in licensing your RPA software. So it, now it's up to you. Tell us what you'd want to see. Would it be fixed price per robot per year? Price per transaction on the business metrics? Volume based, so the robot usage and amount of time? Or a fixed flat fee for the enterprise license? So once again, uh, fixed price per robot per year per transaction, volume based, or a fixed flat fee. Um, while you're voting on this, I'd like to go back to the investment in the uh, research firms with all that extra money. Oh, I'm sorry, I got, I'm got. i still stuck on that. <laughs> um, why don't we keep the poll open for another few seconds? Alan, I'm looking at the results as they come in right now. This is, a, this is absolutely a horse race. Uh, it's unbelievably close. close. Okay, so why don't we close out the poll and let's see what wow, the results are. That is are. amazing. Look at this. We're, we're pretty much yeah. even across the board. So I, I guess my question is, Michael and Sarah, what's your take on that? That's pretty interesting. Do you want to go first, Michael? Yeah, well, when I look at this, and at one time they were they were – Three of them were 27%, so they were exactly the same here a few seconds ago. But, uh, you know, this is an indicative of the conversation that we're going to walk into is, you know, how it's being done today uh, as we go forward here. And I think we'll, why don't we just roll to the next slide here, Sarah, and you can you can jump into the, the initial part of this dialogue and I'll, I'll pick up on it. 
Sure, yeah. Well, I think it's a clear indication that times are changing and people want new licensing models. As you can see, 28% was volume-based pricing. So, um, you know, fixed price, which is what we have currently as the most common type of license, uh, is, uh, you know, in what's said, like fourth place. Very interesting. Yeah, that, that, that is interesting, Sarah, here. And I think, you know, this is likely to evolve over time. So, I mean, if I look at pricing is, is uh, you know, you think of how it's, how it's evolved here. Many of the first initial implementations were, were very small. I mean, in fact, many of them are still, you know, measured in 10 robots, 25 robots, maybe even 50. Uh, but as those use cases increase, um, you know, the ability to price on a per robot uh, basis or or some kind of other proxy for uh, FTE equivalents or things like that. While they sound pretty good because they're matching value with uh, with with what's the results that, that uh, enterprises would see, they become much more complex as you start to think about the use cases expanding through perpetuating throughout the entire enterprise. And when you start getting up there and saying, "Hey, I want to be able to measure, you know, 50 or 100 or 200 or 2,000 or 20,000." Uh, different robotic applications, I think that's going to become very, very difficult to do. And I think ultimately this plot, the RPA pricing comes back to uh, many of the other examples we have out in the industry for SaaS platforms, uh, price per seat, price per headcount, or maybe just a, uh, a flat fee for the entire enterprise, which was one of our choices that came in, was well, tied for first, because and that's where it was. I think they, uh, you know, we'll have to go back to the, to relook at this over time uh, to keep the simplicity there. I think also uh, as we add in more modules, uh, there won't, you know, a robot that's doing simple macros will be very different than a, a, a software or a robot that's doing very complex um, um, processes. And, you know, if you're bringing in AI or you're bringing in OCR, you're bringing in uh, machine learning of some sort, those kinds of additional capabilities that are going to be deployed will not be the same, it won't be one size fits all. So I think we're going to be thinking, seeing different pricing modules as we go forward here. Absolutely. And let's uh, talk about pricing trends now. Um, what we're seeing uh, is that uh, pricing, there are different aspects that affect pricing. So we do, every year we do a lot of research. We talk to enterprises, we talk to um, you know, uh, people are in this business of automation. And uh, what we have found is that um, pricing varies by geography, volume, and it has definitely been dropping across the years. So let's just take a look at uh, on the top left. Uh, and and Sarah, just, just a reference here, we've, we've normalized all these to index them at 100%. So these aren't actual sure. dollars. Yeah. Absolutely. I was just going to say uh, on the top left, you see that North America, we've indexed it at 100 and showing you the rest of geographic areas in comparison with that. And then uh, lower down the market price movement across the years, you'll see that price has been uh, coming down and we expect this trend to continue. Um, then on the top right, you see that price variation by volume, again, indexed at 100. You see the variation there according to the number of robots. And then what Michael was just saying about uh, integration with other solutions and likely changes to come as a result of that. In this example, we've taken AI integrated uh, with, uh, sorry, RPA integrated with AI. So you'll see the variations there as well. So I think this pricing... Anything yeah, it gets really yep. interesting, and and one of the things that uh, that we're working on is a capability to to um, for enterprises to understand how their pricing in their potential deals or, or existing deals uh, plays out and compares to the rest of the industry. So, um, if you're interested in understanding more about pricing uh, at the enterprise level, let us know, and we can help you out on that. Okay, so let's think about the implications here as we move forward. Um, you know, again, another reason, not only just changing capabilities, uh, we do believe pricing is going to move around a lot. So another good reason to keep your, your contract duration short. Um, so, you know, if you're not seeing a, if you, if you keep them long durations, you're going to get locked into something that may or may not make sense 
you know, two, three, four, five years down the road, uh, as your capability, as your needs change, and as the capabilities of the vendors change, you're going to want to be able to have flexibility there. Um, also, it's very easy to think about. I'm not going to spend time thinking about this because it's really small. My contract is for just a few robots. It's twenty-five thousand, maybe it's a hundred thousand. I'm not going to spend a lot of energy thinking about it. But you know, as this, as these deployments get bigger, it's like the ten times or a hundred times where you're at right now. You know, this becomes more critical because these contracts may start to approach sizes that are not just million dollars, but five million or ten million dollars. And uh, you're going to want to be smart about how you put those contracts together, and it will no longer be an afterthought, but it's going to be a critical uh, moment here when you determine what billing units you're going to use, and metrics, and the rates, and and and, and uh, your your value proposition is it matched by what you're paying. So, um, and our last point here is, you know, ensure that those billing me metrics are are understandable and easy to count. Uh, I've heard some people talk about different schemes for pricing, and I look at it and and, and Think back, you know, to my 30 plus years in the industry and think, of, man, that's that sounds really good, but that's going to be very hard to sustain as you scale it. You know, think about change, what's going to change over time. Okay. Okay. So with that, why don't we hit to our, our last area, <coughs> excuse me, of the webinar today, and that's sharing some tips and ideas for managing the challenging existing outsourcing relationships that currently exist. Uh, this is on everyone's mind. So I would like to really uh, hear from, from Michael and Sarah. W what do you think um, are some things, Sarah, that we should be focused on? Oh, well, certainly, yes. Let me, let me tell you about uh, at least three of the different ways that organizations can source their RPA. Uh, you'll see there on this slide, there's, uh, there are three ways highlighted. Uh, one is to go direct and work with the RPA vendor directly. You might also have uh, a system integrator or a consultancy helping you uh, with the initial adoption and deployment of RPA technologies, but say about 80% of the work is done in-house. Uh, another way is to go through a business process service provider, an outsourcing provider, or even an IT service provider, because um, many of the outsourcing service providers do both IT and BPS, and uh, they do also uh, have technology capabilities, so they can deploy uh, automation as a service for you. That's a, a possibility too, and it's well worth talking to them uh, if you already have uh, contracts in place is well worth talking to your outsourcing services providers about the, their capabilities and what they're doing in this area. Then you have the system integrator route where uh, you work through a system integrator. There are specialist firms. You see a group of them here. Uh, we've highlighted, uh, created a representative list for each group. Um, so you get work through a consulting firm or a system integrator and they do the initial onboarding of RPA and deployment, et cetera, moving on to AI for all of these. Really, RPA could be a springboard to AI as well. Uh, and then these, uh, these organizations can actually work with each other as well. So you might see a BPS provider, a business process services provider who's work has a partnership with RPA vendors and works with them or is a reseller for them. You might see them actually having an SI help them with a particular part of the deployment. So all kinds of combinations of these are possible as well. So so yeah. Sarah, you know, you know, at the very beginning I talked about the context of, you know, we've we've kind of had the last ten or fifteen years focused in on the labor arbitrage in that middle layer of this of these uh uh, service providers is what we've been focused in on. And so I think as we go into our next poll question here, we're going to focus on that middle category. You know, there's a lot of opportunity for automation to happen within these service providers and these existing BPO contracts. So, Alan, why don't you open up the poll here? Very okay. So as, as Michael said, thank you. We want to ask everyone, now that there's this desire for services to be automated, in your experience, are outsourced services being automated by the service providers? So the choices are yes, 
and quickly, but value is not being shared. Yes, and quickly, and value is being shared. Um, they are being automated, but at a much slower pace than expected. Um, yes, it is happening, but for new customers only or at renewal time, so as we start into new relationships, or, um, and the sad thing would be E, very little automation is happening. So a lot of different uh, nuances here, but we wanted to get everyone's opinion on, in your experience, you know, do you see this happening now and at what rate? So why don't we keep this poll open? I promise this is the last poll. So all your work will be done after this. So keep it so, open. So Alan, there's not a, I'm looking at the results as they come in here. There is a clear front runner here. And uh, yeah. we have one front runner yeah. and, four top, and, and everybody else is tied for the rest. <laughs> Just about. Okay, so why don't we close the poll then and see who that winner is. And the winner is yes, but at a slow pace. Yeah, and I, I think, thought, yeah, as I look at this one here, you know, you're thinking about this in terms of an outsourcing uh, service providers view of the world. And so, you know, there's not a lot of incentive here for an outsourcer to get real excited about reducing the FTEs because many of them are, are based on, their pricing is based on how many FTEs they sell to, a, to, a, to an enterprise. And so, um, you know, it's, there's an investment to be made here and we'll talk about that over the next couple of slides here, but uh, it's not surprising that they're doing it at a slow pace because there's no real incentive for them to, to, you know, hurry up and reduce their bill to their, to their, to their clients. Okay, so with that said, let me ask Sarah the question of, Okay, so what do enterprises do based on that type of situation? Yes, well, uh, we we believe there are uh, two common routes to incorporating automation within outsourced contracts, and I believe this is one of the questions that I saw coming up as well. Um, you could go for option one, which is an incremental approach. So you work with your outsourcing services provider, you go through the kind of processes that they are providing you at the moment, typically based on FTE pricing, so input pricing, and you uh, identify with them, you work with them, or encourage them to identify where automation could happen, and uh, you know, uh, basically incrementally increase the level of automation uh, within the outsource contract. Um, this incremental approach is probably great for. Um, uh, areas where you might have high levels of exceptions so uh, you know you you learn by doing and you understand where things where exceptions might come up and how you handle them and generally increase uh, the level of automation within uh, the um, the uh, contract I think I saw another question which was about uh, how do you you know how what's the equivalent of robot to people um, Usually, rule of thumb is about two, one robot per two FTEs, but in reality, it doesn't really work like that because um, a robot doesn't typically replace a whole person. They do parts of a process and free up a person to do a percentage of the person's time to do something else. So you have to bear that in mind. And depending on how well you deploy it as uh, the robot, you could actually tweak the environment that it runs in and the coding, so you could actually increase the number of uh, the FT equivalent that the robot, the work that the robot does. Then there's the transformational approach. This is option two on this slide. Uh, you could actually um, go for a big bang approach, probably tied into your bigger digital transformation uh, programs that you, you might already have. And you could actually work with your uh, service provider, negotiate maybe during renewal time or uh, exit point from the contract, and work with them to actually do uh, a transform of the service. So uh, identify um, sort of 70% of things that could be automated and do it and get it done uh, through your partner, through your service delivery partner, your, con your supplier. Go on to the next slide. So the kind of costs and the impact on total cost of ownership to consider. 
um, on the one-time impact, which is those initial setup and change costs. Uh, you will be looking to reduce the input pricing because you'll be using fewer people to deliver the work. Uh, and with that will come other reduced costs, for example, um, transportation of staff, office space, etc. So uh, these kind of things will happen over time. Uh, you'll get higher accuracy rate and speed, possibly improvement in standardization, depending on how you do the automation. Uh, on the cost driver side at the bottom of the, on the left bottom, uh, automation tool costs, you have to get those licenses that we just talked about, training, uh, developing skills, of course working with your service provider who might have these skills already, many of them do, so you'll be working with them on this. Um, and then you will have ongoing costs which is um, the people that you still need to run the operations, those people who handle exceptions, maybe increased capacity for you in some way, um, but you will have reduced annual wage increases, reduced recruitment, training, the higher to retire costs really come down. And uh, you could sort of target, absolutely target, uh, improved standardization, better governance, all of these overall will add to the business case for RPA. Um, if you have a periodic license, you know, the fixed fee or subscription license for your software, of course, that's an annual thing. So on the cost side, you'll have to account for that. Tool maintenance, you know, sometimes you will need larger, you know, major upgrades, which will cost extra. Um, and have to factor in for other things such as potential downtime and knowledge management what uh, you need to do in terms of maintaining the knowledge of those processes that you're automating all right so sarah if you think about that on the, the implications of that to the enterprise here um there there is a lot of excitement on focusing on the uh the software vendors uh in rpa but there's also an equal amount of excitement and i would also say trepidation and fear on the outsourcing uh, service providers and so i know they're all geared up for these conversations they've all been in you know in the in the when we talk to them they're certainly hyper aware of this and they are looking for their ways where they can provide their uh, uh value propositions in the enterprise automation so uh, they'd certainly want to, to to be part of this conversation. Um, if you haven't had that conversation, you know you should absolutely ask that that outsourcing partner that you have today or looking for in the future. What's their plan for that step change in price? You know, how much can I get back, um, and what kind of improvement should I expect uh, when you when you help me enable enterprise automation and RPA into my existing outsourcing contract? Um, now, what you have to remember is this is not a you know this is there's some pain here there's some investment uh ultimately the business case has to work for both parties uh, but if you don't ask or what i put in here in parentheses insist it won't happen because you think about what i referred to earlier if you've got an outsourcing contract that's based on fte and you say hey listen i'm going to help you automate things and i'm going to improve the processes or I'm actually going to reduce the number of headcounts focused on that for some of the, the transactional outsourcing contracts. So this, this is where you would see potential jobs, job savings or job cuts. Um, if you don't ask for it, insist on it, it won't happen. So, and, and, and many of the outsourcers are hyper aware of this. I mean, they understand they're going to have to make, they're going to have to invest. They're going to have to cut some of their revenue streams for existing processes. Uh, but they're going to make up for it or grow their business by helping you get deeper into uh, the automation with the, for the broader enterprise. So, um, and then finally, I want to leave leave this thought here: is this is not just a service provider or a vendor, um, you know, challenge or opportunity here. Uh, the largest part of this is probably going to be more about process redesign within the enterprise. And so, you know, there's only so much you can do with the software. If, if you don't make changes to the process. And so, you know, whenever I have a chance to speak on this, I really want to be very emphatic here that says, yes, we can get all hung up about the, the as I refer to as a sexy robot imagery, but at the same time, this is good old process redesign. 
And while processes look consistent and efficient at the 10,000 or the 100,000 foot level, when you bring them down to the keystroke level, or you bring them down to the process, they may be very different. You may have different uh, ex implementations and systems that have to be rationalized today so that they can be automated and streamlined for the future. So, so Michael, you mean we can't just flip a switch and RPA takes care of everything? Um, you know, that's that sounds good, Alan, but uh, the reality is very different. Okay. Well, I, I want to I wanna thank Michael and Sarah. Um, everyone, please hang on. We're going to have uh, some time for some Q&A, um, and we're looking forward to that. First of all, let me answer a question. I want to apologize. We've had a tremendous number of questions, but the one question we get asked all the time, and my answer to everyone is yes. Yes, you will, for, by registering, you will get a copy of these slides. Um, so those will, will go out to you within the next 48 hours. Um, so everything that we've covered here today, you will get a copy of. Now, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've had a, a large number of people on this call today. We really appreciate it. And we've had a tremendous number of questions. And I know Omar has been uh, diligently trying to answer. I want to apologize if we haven't gotten to everyone, uh, but we will do our best. And we are also tracking these, so we'll be able to get respond to you also after the webinar. But I'm going to start off the Q&A with kind of a broad question from my friend Mark, who uh, asked us and said, um, could you just take a moment to outline what you think um, are the three biggest risks facing the entire RPA sector? So um, I know that's kind of broad based, but I think that will put us in some good context for what we should be concerned about. So let me start so here, Alan. Go, oh, go ahead, go ahead go. Michael. <laughs> I'd start with the hype in the, in the, in the, you know, there's a lot of hype out there right now and the promises that are being uh, uh, put out there, uh, there could get ahead of a little bit of the, the reality. So I, I look at that as if we're not careful to match up the, you know, the, re the reality of here's what's happening with the software, here's what's happening with the service providers, and here's what's happening in, inside of your own organization as an enterprise. If those get out of sync, then we could have a problem. That's probably the number one risk I look at it. Uh, so I have a I have a different uh, view. Uh, I think um, RPA vendors must invest in um, scale, uh, so managing scale, enabling enterprises to manage automation at scale. Uh, at the moment, we have relatively small deployments and organizations do want to scale up and do more. And that's where the real business value is realized. Um, but they've got to be able to manage armies of robots. And for that, we need control panels that offer additional capabilities that drill through and allow you to group robots together and you drill through to the group that you want and then further drill through down into what, whatever it is that you want. So making uh, automation at scale um, a, a strong a strong offering and um, unless they do that the market will stay at a small uh, adoption level and uh, people will try and scale and they won't be able to scale well and they'll sort of go back to running um, you know really tactical deployment so this is I think uh, probably in my eyes that's the biggest risk yeah, Sarah, let me let me go back with a different risk. And if you go back to slide 11 there, if we could move, move the uh, presentation to slide 11 for just one second here. I think the other one, while I, I talked about the risk being of overhyping it, I think there's a, another risk here of, of, of others not understanding the potential here. And I think if you, yeah, uh, yeah, right there, right there. Oops. That one. If we don't think about what the potential for uh, this could do for our enterprises. I mean, we're having a labor shortage out there in the U.S. and you in in Europe, and you know we're going to need uh, productivity tools for the enterprise that allow us to drive continued growth in our organizations. If we can't get the resources uh, directly by hiring more bodies, we need to find ways to make our existing uh, workforce more productivity, more more productive, and allow us to continue to grow our top line. And so I think it, the, 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 while I, I worry about the hype and people getting a little ahead of their skis, I also worry about people not considering 
the potential here when you bring all these things together. It is more than macros, but uh, it is going to have a, a big impact for those organizations that can adopt not just the basics, but also think further ahead. Great. Okay, let me ask another question. Uh, this comes from Tommy. Uh, Tommy wants to know, so how are companies using RPA from a front office perspective, like HR processes, finance, invoicing, CRM, et cetera? How, how are they leveraging that? What are you seeing, Sarah? We've seen it right across the organization, but by far the biggest area is industry-specific processes. Uh, that accounts for something like 35%. Uh, F&A is a very, finance and accounting is where really it all started and continues to be, a lot, you know, drive a large section of demand. Um, contact center, we see usage in contact center, procurement, HR, these are, you know, by the time we get to procurement, HR, IT services and so on, we're talking only about um, a sort of single digit percentage of the overall uh, market. but. Uh, it's not to say that people won't do more. It's just where they've started are typically are in industry specific and F and A. But um, interestingly, the rate of growth for use of RPA in IT services and procurement at the moment is higher than say industry specific because that's the more mature usage of it. So this data is in our market report, RPA market report uh, that you can get from our website. Super. Well, we have so many more questions, but hey, no hey, more. I, I want to answer one one question on here really quickly. It just came in. What's okay. the range of benefits you see for the process areas? I mean, what we're hearing from the clients is a thirty percent cost improvement, uh, and a and that's and that's for for across the board, and an operational improvement's between thirty and fifty percent. I mean, that so that helps underpin when I talk about value being created uh, for not only the vendors, but for the enterprises and also for Wall Street slash Silicon Valley. And that, that's going to underpin the virtuous circle we started with. Perfect. Okay, so we are out of time. I want to thank Michael and Sarah and Amar. I more importantly want to thank all of our attendees. We hope this was worthwhile. I know 60 minutes is hard to get this huge, complex, robust topic in. Um, but if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to either Sarah or Michael or myself, um, and we'll be glad to help you in any way possible. <clears throat> and then also, please don't forget to join us for our next webinar on Wednesday, August 29th. It'll be our Service Provider Vantage Point Plus webinar, along with our Q3 2018 Market Vista update. Thank you very much. Have a great day, and we will hopefully speak to you all soon.